Chargers. Touchdown, UCLA. With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Dyrude on the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. What's up, L.A.? This is Ryan Dyrud with the L.A. Football Podcast, and support for LAFB is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineering tools for your family jewels. Guys, I know a lot of you skip past these ads or just ignore them, but this is one that will actually benefit you every single time you use this product. The worst thing you can do is get nicks, cuts, scrapes, gashes, anything to your southern region down below it's painful it's gross you don't want it so that's why manscaped has redesigned the electric trimmer the manscaped engineering team spent 18 months that's a year and a half perfecting the greatest ball hair trimmer ever created and just released the new and improved lawnmower 3.0 and even better you get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code lafb at manscaped.com that's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code LAFB. I promise you, your balls will thank you. What's up, Los Angeles? Welcome back to the LA Football Podcast here on the Believe Podcast Network, always on LAFBnetwork.com, your destination for Los Angeles football. I'm very pleased and excited to say Frosty is back with me on the Wear Waves. Missed you last episode. Frost, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm good, brother. Thanks for having me back. Hey, with the, the warm uh, welcome. LA, what's going on? It's your boy Frost. Let's talk about it. Yeah, dude. No, I, it's, uh, you've been you've been hustling, been grinding, and uh you know, busy guys. So I, I thanks for uh, getting back on with me and excited to uh, talk about this off season so far and, uh, and get into it. But uh, what are you been up to? How you been? Man, I'm good, man. Duty call. Sometimes you have to uh, put your hard hat on and get to work. I've just been uh, taking a couple things that I've been passionate about through the finish line. And I'm pretty sure I'll be sharing all the good news on here. Once these things get through the finish line, um, but I'm feeling good. I feel uh, rejuvenated from, uh not in recording with you and no, i was kidding i'm just joking no it feels good to be back man let's talk some football i want to uh, talk football yeah absolutely so i i love to uh you know every guest we have on that knows you always says you know what a hard work you were in your career so obviously that has spilled over to uh, uh what you're doing now and i know some of it on the back end but yeah once it's all good and through excited to announce that but glad to uh glad to have you back and, and jumping in here and we're gonna keep this episode i think just you know, fresh and light. And we have the new league year coming up on March 15th. So, you know, just two weeks away. Uh, I, I covered a lot of free agency prospects last episode. So this one will uh, just kind of uh, shoot it. Of course, got to mention the sponsor of the LA football podcast, betonline.ag. Football might be over, but NBA, college basketball, and the NHL are in full swing. I don't know if you caught that uh, outdoor game up at Lake Tahoe, but I enjoyed it, even though there was like a 10 hour delay. Uh, for the Avs and Vegas game, but still cool to see. The only place you should be doing betting on these events is at betonline.ag. BetOnline even covers the awards shows. You know, we just had the Golden Gobes last night, TV shows, and reality TV. Frost loves himself some 90 Day Fiance. I prefer The Bachelor, but hey, that's a different story. BetOnline has hundreds of props with real-time odds on almost anything you can imagine. So head to the website, or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. That's betonline.ag. BetOnline, your online sportsbooks experts. Let's start with this, Frost. Just breaking news today. I know it's not necessarily LA football related, but it does pertain to our Rams because it's in the division. J.J. Watt decides to sign with the Cardinals, your, your former team. Were you surprised by that, or what did you think of the signing? I was very surprised. I didn't think that was going to be on the, the radar. Everyone was thinking maybe Pittsburgh with his brother, uh, maybe the Green Bay Packers because he's from Wisconsin. Um, never the Cardinals. It never crossed my mind, but, you know, they wanted him. And it looked like the the owner, you know, he, he rolled out the red carpet that Michael Bidwell, you know, yeah. took him in his jet, you know, got a ride over in the Audi to the facility. Mm-hmm. J.J. Watts doing big things. 
Yeah, I know your former team. And uh, I was definitely surprised too. Cause every, yeah, it was, uh, it seemed like there was the Pittsburgh tie with his brother, obviously. And then uh, Cleveland, I think was up there. Green Bay was up there. Cause you know, he played at Wisconsin and uh, right. didn't, yeah, didn't see Arizona, but you know, he, I think the deal was two years, like 33 million or so. So over 15 million a year. So maybe that was the highest offer. Maybe the fact that, you know, that defense has a lot of good young pieces. They have Chandler Jones on the other side, who's arguably the best pass rusher in the game that just doesn't get talked about. So, so maybe he just thinks he believes in that team to, uh, to really do what they did in the beginning of last season and not how they finished. He could be that piece that helps them finish maybe. Yeah, man, it's a good addition. You know, you got Chandler Jones on the other side. We'll see what they do with Hassan Reddick and Marcus Golden. Um, but he adds – you know, quality to the defensive line. Obviously, my good friend and our good friend here at the LA Football Podcast, Coach Brinson Buckner, mm-hmm. um, he's there. So, you know, we, we've seen what he's done with defensive linemen. Um, I'm sure he's excited to, you know, work his craft with, you know, a guy of J.J. Uh, Watt's caliber and see what J.J. has left in the tank, man. And, you know, I want to see this uh, – you know, him fulfill these last two years. I don't want to see him too injured and things like that. Knock on wood. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to see him uh, go out and, and have fun, you know, and um, Arizona's a great crowd. It's a, it's a, it's a great uh, franchise to, to be a part of. It's the, the ownership treats the players well, treats them like, you know, pros, man. And um, it's a, it's a, it's a great place to live uh, community wise. Um, go have a good time there in the desert. Absolutely. Uh, curious for us, just from your, put the GM hat on since that's, uh, your future bidding, I think here soon. Do you, for the Cardinals, obviously you know what JJ Watt's capable of as a player when he's healthy. Um, and this is, you know, more, I guess, fun to get into since it's not our team. So you don't have to worry about what you say, I guess, or at least, or maybe you do, I don't know, but do you think this is a good, <laughs> do you think this is a good signing for the Cardinals? Or do you just think they had other areas of need, uh, that they should have addressed with, uh, with that money, perhaps, do you think this is a sign that maybe puts them over the hump? Well, you would thought offensive line. That's what I was going to go with. You, you think offensive line, and mm-hmm. um, that that was my main concern, main main free agent um, accusation that I would take at yeah. the, for the Cardinals, me personally. Yeah. But you know, do you let a guy like JJ Watt, where you can afford him, you know, technically, you know, you can afford him based on what you feel for him as a player. Yeah. Um, you take a shot on that, you know, and I think it's, it's something for the fans to get, you know, more excited about and, you know, defensive line is the front line of defense and, you know, you, you put some um, future hall of famers together, you know, let's see what happens. Yeah. I mean, it's never a bad signing. I, I just, I agree with you when you look at purely that paying that position, that premium, uh, I believe Arizona ranked fourth in the NFL in sacks per game. So it wasn't like that was, they weren't like they were the Raiders where they just, they really needed uh, someone that could get after the pass rusher. I mean, they had that, that in their wheelhouse. And you mentioned Hassan Reddick and Marcus Golden, who they could have brought back probably for cheaper, but um, yeah, I mean, it's not, a, it's not like it's going to hurt them by any means. It's just, you would have been curious if they could have allocated that money, uh, spread it out to protect Kyler Murray, who's obviously probably the the franchise guy in the face of that franchise for the long term. And uh, he got they, the reason why they missed the playoffs most likely last year is because of how banged up he got and, you know, wasn't really as mobile as he needs to be for his style of game. So, but we'll see how it pans out. Let me ask you this on our side. What does this mean for the Rams? You think, I mean, the Rams, I think are the team to be right now. I know uh, technically Seattle won the division, but with getting Matthew Stafford with Seattle, having all the controversy regarding Russell Wilson, um, I think the Rams, currently as it stands still a lot to be said with free agency and the draft with the Rams team to be but Arizona was a hot team early on tapered out but now they get this out does that pose a problem for the Rams or do you just think the Rams are still leaps and bounds above at the moment um Kyle Murray's uh, he's a talent you know and um I don't think they didn't go for an offensive lineman on the simple fact that he's going to get himself hit and hurt and that's the style of play that they have him in. He's not supposed to sit back there and get rid of the ball. He moves around, he runs, he's sliding, he's jumping, he's cutting, uh, and he's a small guy. So, you know, he's got to – I don't think the emphasis is on offensive line where you would think so, but they run enough read options where he's getting hit by linebackers and defensive backs also. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just defensive linemen. 
uh, sacking them, so to say. When you look at the Rams, their first line of defense needs to be offensive line. You need to have some debt. Uh, we love Big Wit. He needs someone behind him, another person to mold um, for the future. Ryan, the big question here is who's going to be playing center for your Rams? Mm-hmm. You know, Austin Blythe, is, he's going to free agency. He's going to go look around and see if anyone wants his services. I, I want to know who's going to, you know, play center. Who's going to be the quarterback on that offensive line, you know, directing where the blitzes are coming from, sliding the line, getting guys lined up. Um, you know, the center position is a very key component on the offense. And with a new quarterback, you need a, a, a trusted guy hiking them the ball. You can't have any of these fumbled snaps. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a big position. So who's playing center for the offensive line of the Rams? Yeah, I mean, it's it's outside of some of the defensive players is definitely the biggest uh, question mark heading into the offseason. And we've talked about it a bunch. Uh, about how on defense we think most likely John Johnson and Leonard Floyd are probably gone just because of how much money they'll they'll command and and I think Troy Hill and Darius Williams I think will be retained because of their market value and with the Rams you know they're not going to get anything better for that price value so I think they'll be able to bring them back but yeah at center you know Austin Corbett you know making close to four million this year he's probably going to garner around that maybe a little bit more because he did have some success this year did have some struggles as well um, so if it were me Frost, I would, I would try to bring him back. I just don't think the market, you're going to have to pay more to upgrade. I mean, that sounds dumb to say, it sounds obvious to say, but the Rams just have zero money to play with. And so if, if the upgrade, unless it's going to be a huge upgrade, um, I don't think they they need to be spending at that position or they even let him walk slide us in Corbett over to center who, where he's played before and draft a center in the mid rounds, let him develop behind there and to see what this new, uh, offensive line coach can do that they brought over from Stanford is, is, if he's going to want new guys in there. So um, it, it's an interesting position to watch. It's an extremely, yeah. like you mentioned, and especially with the new quarterback, I mean, maybe the last yeah. Matthew, what he wants to do too. The center position is going to be a really key. Again, it's going to be a really key uh, thing we need to watch. Um, they traded their franchise quarterback for another franchise quarterback. So the question marks there, did they make the right move? Was it, you know, too premature? Should they just hold, held on to golf just a little bit more? Mm-hmm. Or did they make the right move, ship them, get someone new? So all eyes are on that. So the center position has to be right. If you're going to draft someone, you know, he better be the best one in the draft that can really compete for a job now. Smart guy, tough guy. And what I mean by tough, uh, reliable, uh, get guys lined up, very mature for his age. You know, if you're going to go for a guy, get a guy. You know, mm-hmm. because and the window for the Rams is going to be closing if they, they didn't hit on this golf trade. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's uh, we'll see very quickly if, if they made the right decision uh, or, you know, in, in a few years, probably. I think this year they're still going to be competitive regardless. But are they going to win the Super Bowl, which is obviously the reason why they did this. And yeah, the center position, the continuity on the offensive line. That's been one thing we talked about a lot for us is this line improves so much because in year two, having that continuity playing all together as a unit, you know, you would know this more than I would, but I feel like sometimes even just removing one piece, you can throw everything off just a little bit. You, you know, the gaps aren't as sound because, you know, they're used to the one guy working this way as opposed to another way. So maybe you get a better talent in, but if he's not, you know, in line, pun intended with the rest of the line it throws things off a little bit maybe so maybe I'm, I'm completely off my rocker there but I just think the continuity is key and so that is why I personally lean towards just bringing Blythe back if the price is right obviously he's, if he's going to go out and command eight nine million from some franchise the Rams can't compete with that but if he can come back around the m- number he's at I just think it'd be very wise of them to bring him back for that number and keep the line intact when you have a brand new quarterback albeit he's a veteran brand new to your system that you want to have as comfortable as possible from day one so you can make this run deep into the playoffs and in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, you, you throw very good, solid points out there. You know, if they could retain him to come back, you know, that's good. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not a bad thing. He, and Like I said, he's a center position. That's a very, very key position on the front. Um, and especially with Stafford coming in, you want someone there that has the, you know, that's primed for, for, for what's about to happen. You know, um, someone that has to be play larger than life because uh, that's where the Rams are. They made that big trade and uh, everyone's looking at them. You know, it, it's a boomer bust situation for them. I love the trade, by the 
way. Yeah. But you can't put anyone in there that doesn't have any reps or is not competent enough to to call that line. You know, you're you're starting tackle at 39 or 40 years old. Andrew Whitworth shouldn't be shouting down to the auto all the way to the other side of what people need to do. Your center needs to be ready to go because that run game is going to be uh, another one of the biggest things that's going to help this offense move. You got to be able to, you know, play that play action. And, you know, guys came on late, you know, in the season and start running the ball hard, mm -hmm. but they need a way better consistent run game. Yeah. Well, and that's a great point that a lot, a lot of people don't recognize is that the center does, you know, command a lot of the offense and calling out, you know, certain assignments and blocking assignments at the line of scrimmage before the, the ball is snapped. So, you know, having that continuity, as I keep saying, I know he's probably getting old, but that's super important. So for awesome curious, you played all over the line. Who did you prefer to go up against? Did you like going up against the center, the guard or the, or the tackle? The center. <laughs> <laughs> and I say this with conviction because I, I know how important the center position is, yeah. but Oftentimes, the center is the worst blocker on the offensive line. The <laughs> exactly. center is just a help guy, right? Yeah. He's a smart guy. He's a help guy. Um, some of them are very stern and, and stout, and you know you'll have a rough day with them. But a lot of times, um, they're considered the worst blocker on the offensive line. Mm -hmm. So I would rather go versus center. You know, they're not overly too big. So you know, I've I've had a lot of success in that um, a gap. Yeah. I love it. I remember we in high school, we had our, he was a left tackler, right tackle. He played tackle and he was nasty, man. Probably the, he was by far the best offensive lineman. Just, just the way he played was just your, your typical like lineman, just nasty. It reminds me of when you told stories about, uh, about KO that you play with up in Oakland. Now he's uh, with the chiefs. I uh, just, yeah, that nasty, nuts. just that nasty, not, got in fights almost every practice, but our, he, uh, played tackle. One of our guards got hurt and it was such a big drop off from guard. They slid him inside. And then our center was struggling so much. They ended up moving into center just because they knew he was that talented and can play, you know, good at anywhere on the offensive line. And so he had to learn them to snap the ball week six had never done it before. And uh, ended up being a, uh, I don't know if he was all state, but he was, he was high up there in uh in center rankings because he was that good. So he was one of the few good blocking centers, but he started off as tackle. Dude, I remember a guy out of Colorado, Jeff Byers. He came to USC. He was like Mr. Football. He was out of Fort Collins. You remember that mm -hmm. name? It sounds familiar. Yeah, Jeff Byers. Yeah, Jeff Byers. He was yeah. like the number one recruit in the whole country. He came to USC with us. He battled some injuries, but he was a heck of a football player. He's right there down the street from you. There you go. So, so you met him at Colorado State, and then he came with you to USC? No, he, was, uh, he came to USC as a recruit. When oh, I was okay. At gotcha, school. gotcha but he was from Colorado. So that's cool. All right. A few of us Colorado guys make it not a ton, not as many as California, but Hey, some of us make it there. No, no. You guys got some good ball players. Yeah. You go through it. Colorado has some good um, high school sports and a lot of guys go pro different sports, you know, but yeah. they go pro. At least this is what I'll say. At least Colorado high school ball, our like division system, at least makes sense. California. I, I like it. I still get so confused by California's, you know, division one, two, three, but then they, they all play against each other. Colorado was one, a two, a three, four, a five, a you had your division, winner of the division went on to the playoffs. It was like that simple. California yeah. just confuses the hell out of me. It does. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't get it either. Um, because my, my school itself has been in like four different divisions, like yeah. since I even left. And it's like, how, what happened? You know, like my, my buddy who coaches at uh, fountain Valley, they yeah. are, I want to say they're division three, but in their, in their conference, they have Los Al who's division one. So they have to play each other, but they, they don't even, their play doesn't matter and play. I don't know. It's, it's super confusing. Every time he tells me, I'm like, that makes no sense. Like when I just have a actual tiered system that you're like stuck in. So anyway, Colorado is just simple. Maybe I'm just not smart enough to get it. <laughs> no, it's pretty good. Your accurate. It's pretty good. Yeah. So all right, before we get into the next topic on the LA Football Podcast, I'm calling on all sneakerheads out there. Take a brief moment to talk about our newest sponsor, eBay. Whether rare, dead stocked, or the latest release, find the exact shoe you're looking for. As the original sneaker marketplace, eBay is a place to go to cop the pair you've been eyeing. With eBay's authenticity guarantee, your sneakers are meticulously inspected by independent professional authenticators. A team of experienced sneaker authenticators verify the box, 
the logo, the stitching, and dozens of other inspection points, so you're guaranteed to get the authentic pair that you want. And for sneaker sellers out there, eBay has eliminated selling fees on sneakers $100 and up, making it free to sell or flip your collection. So go to ebay.com slash sneakers today. That's ebay.com slash sneakers, the world's best destination for discovering great value and unique selection. All right, Frost, I wanted to, before we, uh, you know, we're breezing through this, I want to talk about our last episode together because we had an awesome guest, Coach Frank Smith, uh, offensive line coach and run game coordinator of the Chargers. I thought it was an awesome interview, awesome guy. Excited to have him on again. Great to know him. But I know you wanted to kind of touch on our conversation and just the importance that that he has. You know, this seems to be the theme of this episode anyway. It's talking about offensive line, defensive line. So let's talk about his importance to this tar- Charger team and turning uh, that franchise around to a, a winning organization this year. Yeah, it, it's similar to my rant about the Rams. Um, it's all going to come down in the run games for both these ball clubs. They got the quarterbacks to get the ball down the field. Obviously, we got to get some pieces at the wide receiver uh, position for both teams. You can always use depth. You need a, someone to fly down the field, catch deep balls and, and all that. But you got quarterbacks in, in L.A. that can really chuck the ball around the field. And the run game is going to be so key. So, you know, you Charger fans out there that are listening, um, I hate to put the pressure on my coach, right? I hate to put the pressure on Coach Smith, but he has such a, a key job this year because if they can play action pass down the field and they can run, uh, sustain a run game and let Justin get anyone to bite on the run, it's mm-hmm. over. Totally. Right? It, it's completely over. He's going to get some new receivers. He's going to get some help. You know, Brandon Staley is going to get him some help. He's going to get someone that's going to run down the field and, and stretch out. Mike Williams, if he comes back, I think he'll be rejuvenated knowing what his quarterback can do. And this might be a breakout season for the kid. Mm-hmm. Um, you got to run the ball. So, Coach Smith, run some powers. You know, get you know, run, run over some linebackers. Get you a, a, a hog at your number one pick that's going to pull and, you know, clean out a defensive end with, with a trap block or – or, you know, someone that can grab a three technique and put them in the cheap seats, you know, get someone like that, please, for you Charger fans, because the run game will open up everything. Look across the league. All these quarterbacks that have success, they have a run game, you know, besides Mahomes. He's a little different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. They, they still, though, they spent a first round pick on uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire and and uh, had had a top offensive line unit uh, in the league anyway. So he still has a run game and is still able to use that play action to to his advantage. So, uh, so speaking of that run game frost, obviously there's their franchise guy is Austin Eckler, who I think is dynamic. We talked about a lot. Um, super fun to watch can catch the ball in the backfield. They drafted Joshua Kelly last year in the, you know, fourth round who showed some promise early on, uh, then had a couple fumble issues and ended up being a healthy scratch later down the line. Justin Jackson, uh, has always been an explosive type runner, but he just can never stay healthy. Do you think the Chargers, you don't have to give any names, but do you think they should use, whether it's in free agency or in the draft, go and get a big bruising guy like you just kind of talked about that can just run between the tackles and use Austin Eckler more of a change of pace guy? Or do you think their room is okay? They just need to fortify the offensive line and then let Frank Smith do his thing. That's a great question, Ryan. You can always use depth. Always. So it, if they can find a running back out there that suits their needs, what is their need? You know, Mm -hmm. the Rams had success when they had girly. So do you need a bigger guy that can hit the edge, uh, a guy that's opposing his will and they're kind of afraid to tackle him, a guy that's tall and and structure, you know, what is their guy that they're looking for? You know, I'm, I'm really uh, anxious to see what moves these chargers make to build this roster. Um, Frank Smith has a heck of a job to do. Again, it goes back to him. What, run plays are they going to be calling you know they were doing these zone reads and stuff like this or they're going to get a a hoss up here and run some powers and and eat the clock and move the chains you know if they do that it opens up so much for their whole offense and whole and that's the only way to save these quarterbacks these years yeah you know i i was so high on joshua kelly because i loved watching him at ucla and he really came onto the scene good early on and then just, I don't know if there was a riff in the coaching or, or what happened. And, you know, obviously when you have two fumbles and two key moments, that's going to hurt your playing time. So 
I think he can still be that guy because he kind of was, I wouldn't call him a mauler by any means, but he could run between the tackles successfully at UCLA. He was a high volume guy. There was games he had 30 plus carries. But yeah, like you said, for us, I would not be mad at all if they got a cheap running back. I mean, we, we keep looking at Rams players that could potentially come to the Chargers and Malcolm Brown's a guy with the Rams who is exactly that build, just, you know, gives you six to 10 carries a game that can just pound it. Um, so he's a guy maybe the Chargers could even go after. Maybe use a late round pick. I think they need to have other needs in the draft, but if that's something they need to do, wouldn't hate it. So, so yeah, I think we're in the same page there that, yeah, you can always use more depth. And because they've been banged up, I mean, last year they had to bring in three different running backs off the street, you know, Kalen Balaj being the latter to come play running back for them. You, you probably want to uh, ha- add some depth, depth there, I would assume. <laughs> yeah. But again, what you're saying is your running backs are young though. Right. So if they had, if you have something that you can uh, bet on is that they're going to get better, you know, with the new coaching staff, I, you know, I'd like to say that people's, I don't even know if I can say this on the bleak network, but (laughs) their buttholes get tight. There's a term (laughs) that you said, their buttholes get tight when, you know, you get a new coaching staff and, and you know, you're not their guy. They didn't draft you. They have no ties to you. So all you have to do is produce. And, you know, what you're going to see is a level of competition go up at OTAs and minicamp uh, as much time as there is in practice. Those guys are going to show out because they want to be a part of this team because, like I said, they're not their picks. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. We've seen we talked about that on the Chargers roundtable, right? How kind of Anthony Lynn's staff to to a fault stuck by his picks and now that these now that the new coaching staff is in there's like hey we're going to go our own direction best guy plays best move works for our future so so i think we'll see some changes but i think frank smith has maybe the hardest job in the nfl this season being on a new staff taking over one of the worst units taking over a unit that literally has three returning linemen because the rest are all free agents so we don't even know what this unit's going to look like come april 20 april or march 31st whatever march 2nd after the draft um, so yeah, he's got a, his work cut out for him, but, uh, from everything I can tell and from what you've told me Frost, I think he is, a, a the man for the job and going to do a great job down there. Yeah. He's definitely a committed guy. He's a guy that, um, takes his job very serious. Um, he has a good time out there. Offense alignment will love him. Uh, I see what he did with a tight end room and everyone is at ease in, um, tight situations. Guys made big plays and that's leadership in your room. You know, obviously the players play and the coaches coach, but you know, being at ease out there going to a, a game fully prepared and knowing your plays that all comes from coaching and how he gets across those players. So the offensive line, whoever he picks out there and how he builds this thing are going to be guys that he trusts guys that, uh, are like him, good natured mm-hmm. guys, fun guys, guys that probably drink some beer, you know, and Love it. Um, that's what you need. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's important. And, and having that love and passion for the game. And he, that's what he kept talking to is love over toughness. Cause uh, all these guys I think are tough in some level. So uh, I can't wait to see it. I think it's going to be, a, I, I've talked about it before. I think this Chargers team is going to be a playoff team next year. And it starts in the trenches, starts in this free agency period, starts in the draft. And uh, Frank Smith will be at the forefront of that. So looking forward to seeing it. Frost, before we wrap up, this has been a fun, loose, easy show. But I I wanted to ask you this. As we get into free agency 14 days from the legal tampering period on March 15th, um, you you talked about it before. You kind of enjoyed the one-year contract, proving yourself, being able to have that flexibility. Do you have any fun free agency stories or negotiations? Or is it always pretty cut and dry? Or anything you can tell us just about what it's like being a free agent in the NFL? Well, it's just another stressful time, you know, um, even if you play good and you have a great resume, well, unless you're a JJ Watt, a three time yeah. um, NFL defensive player of the year, it's a stressful time because you don't know where you could end up. You're looking for the best fit for you. Um, or you're looking for a more of an opportunity. You know, I, like you, you mentioned, I love the one year deals personally because I played out my contract. It was between me wanting to play again and not the, team telling me uh we're going to go in a different direction Mm -hmm. you know i was trying to eliminate the the process of getting cut you know (laughs) it happened one time in my career and uh, it wasn't a good feeling so i kind of shielded myself from that Uh, you know you would always you know you'd always want to sign a a two or three year deal but once you get later in your career you know 
that's when you become a cap casualty. You know, they, they start looking at your age if you guys don't win the Super Bowl. And even if you do, they start looking at your age. So um, the one-year deal worked for me. I don't have any really funny scenarios with it. Um, you know, free agency is just, you know, it's kind of a stressful time, yeah. you know, because you can have to pick up and move your family somewhere else if for the love of the game. Uh, you're hoping you build enough relationships um, at the place you're at and they want you back, you know, cause you don't want to move. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but it all, it always works out, you know, one way or another, you just got to have the right attitude and get, be prepared to work, you know, cause if you go to a new city, uh, you got to put your heart down on. I went to a new city. No one knew me in Arizona. You get a chance to make a name for yourself, get more friends and fans and family uh, from being in a new community. You know, you get a chance to uh, meet new people, go to different hospitals and, you know, and, and bring smiles to kids' faces and go to schools and read to, you know, different kids in different areas. And, you know, it's all about the experience of being a pro football player. So, you know, it's a good and bad thing. It, it depends on what you're looking for and what, you're, what, you, what you really uh, want out of your career. Yeah. Some mm-hmm. people want stability. You know, mm-hmm. they just want to stay at the same place. Some people are chasing a ring and are trying to, you know, weigh their options and see what their agent can do to get them, you know, on a certain ball club. You know, but at the end of the day, having the job <laughs> is yeah. the best feeling. Yeah, that helps. Yeah, I've always been curious because, you know, that you, we as fans will get the, the look at, you know, the, the glamour, if you will, of free agency for the superstar that talks about, you know, the freedom to, to go out there and make the, the five year, $110 million deal. But then there's the other side of the players that are, you know, am I going to get signed by a team? I'm not saying that's you, but just the, the other end where it's very different approach as opposed to, all right, I'm going to have 32 teams that want me. Who's going to pay me the most as, okay, I need to find someone who's going to pay my paycheck next year. And um, so, yeah, I, I totally get it. I mean, you're basically jobless. So I can totally see I'd be super stressful. That's, you know, a lot of us can relate this past 2020 with this pandemic, I think. <laughs> yeah. It's just the fear of the unknown. You yeah. know, and when, you know, the unknown is always in football because you're a play away from Mm-hmm. Anything could happen. You can get released one day. You can get uh, injured. And, you know, there's just so many things that can happen. So it goes hand in hand. It's just part of, you know, making that football dream a reality, you know? Totally. Totally. So, well, you did it, my friend, for 13 years. So uh, well done. And yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it up with that. I think uh, we got a lot of things looking forward to. We got some guests coming up this week. Later in the week that we will, uh, Welcome on a um, couple of Rams and Chargers guests that we'll uh, kind of end the week with. So looking forward to that. So uh, Frost, as always, thanks uh, for jumping on with me, talking some ball. Where can everyone uh, find you at? Yeah, you can find me at The Organic Frost, and uh, that's on everywhere. You guys know, hit me up. Uh, let's send us some emails. Let me know what's going on, what's the topics you guys want to talk about, who we need to interview. You know, we got Rams, we got Chargers, UCLA, and even SC. So holler at us. That's right. Yeah, we got we got we're doing some prospect talk too with UCLA and USC. So don't worry, we haven't we haven't forgot about them. It's just been a crazy couple of weeks for us here at the uh, the LA Football Network. So you can find me at Ryan Dyer LAFB on Twitter, the main account at LAFB Network everywhere. Twitter, Instagram. Check out our YouTube channel at LAFB Network. Subscribe, please, on YouTube and wherever you listen. We certainly appreciate it. Hope everyone has a uh, fantastic beginning of your week. And uh, we're, we're excited to break down more of what's going on in the LA football world and talk to you guys all later in the week. So Frost, thanks again. Have a great evening and looking forward to talking to you in a few days. For sure, Ryan. Thanks. I'll talk to you soon, LA.